Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the space topic in the National 5 Physics exam. So let's get started. Now, the SQA split the space topic into two key areas. So we have cosmology and we have space exploration. So we're going to go through each of these in turn and see what you need to know and be able to do for the exam. So for the first section, cosmology, you need to be able to use the term light year and convert between light years and meters. So remember light year is defined as the distance travelled by light in one year, i.e. it's not a time, it's a distance. And to convert between light years and meters, you can either remember that one light year is equal to 9.46 times 10 to the power of 15 meters. And so if you're going from light years to meters, you multiply by that number, or if you're going from meters back to light years, you divide by that number. Or you can find out how many meters are in one light year by doing a speed distance time calculation. So remember if you start off with d equals vt, you can use the speed of light 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and find out how many seconds are in one year to use that as your time. And to do that you would do 365 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. And that would give you how many seconds are in one year. And if you plug that into your d equals vt with the speed of light, you'll get the value of 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters for your one light year. It then says you need to give a basic description of the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe. So remember the Big Bang theory suggests that the universe started as an infinitely hot, infinitely dense single point of matter called a singularity, and that the universe rapidly expanded or inflated from this single point. And over time, the universe has cooled down, i.e. its temperature has decreased, and we're now at an average temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin. It then says you need to know the approximate estimated age of the universe. So remember, the age of the universe is roughly 13.8 billion years old, not million, billion. Or you could round it to 14 billion years old. Next, you need to have awareness of the use of the whole electromagnetic spectrum in obtaining information about astronomical objects. So remember, different types of detectors are needed to pick up different types of signals. So if we think about detectors for each of them, remember for radio or TV waves, we have an aerial. For microwaves, we have an aerial as well. For infrared waves, we would have a photodiode. For visible light, we would have the retina of the eye. For ultraviolet waves, we would have fluorescent chemicals. For x-rays, we would have photographic film. And for gamma rays, a Geiger-Muller tube. Or you could think about telescopes for each type of electromagnetic radiation. So remember we said that there are telescopes for every type of EM radiation. So radio telescopes to detect radio waves, microwave telescopes to detect microwaves, gamma ray telescopes to detect gamma rays, and so on. You also need to be able to identify continuous and line spectra. So remember a continuous spectrum is just a full spectrum of colours of the rainbow going from red at one end to violet at the other end. And that can be produced by passing white light through a triangular prism. But for line spectra, remember we have two types of line spectra called line absorption spectra or line emission spectra. And remember line absorption spectra look like a continuous spectra with the full range of colours, but there are certain wavelengths of light that have been removed. So you'll see dark bands or dark lines appearing on the continuous spectrum. Whereas line emission spectrum are sort of the opposite. You'll see just an entirely black band with particular lines or bands of different colours of light corresponding to different wavelengths. And lastly for section 1, you need to be able to use spectral data for known elements to identify the elements present in stars. And that means using line spectra to compare different spectra and match up the lines with those present in the spectrum for a star. And remember we've done this in the worked example video for stars and spectra. Moving on to the second key area, space exploration, you need to have basic awareness of our current understanding of the universe. And this includes using the following terms correctly and in context. So we've got planet, dwarf planet, moon, sun, asteroid, solar system, star, exoplanet, galaxy and universe. And some popular definitions to point out here would be things like a dwarf planet. So remember, a dwarf planet is like a planet, but it's not able to clear its orbital path of debris. We also have a moon here, which remember is a natural satellite of a planet. Another useful one to remember would be the definition for the star, which remember is a hot ball of gases under which remember is a hot ball of gases undergoing nuclear fusion and emitting electromagnetic radiation or light. And lastly, we have an exoplanet. So remember, an exoplanet is a planet outside of our solar system. Next, you need to have awareness of the benefits of satellites, such as GPS, weather forecasting, communications, scientific discovery, and space exploration, for example, the Hubble telescope or the ISS. And it's worth being able to describe some of these uses. You also need to know that geostationary satellites have a period of 24 hours and orbit at an altitude of 36,000 kilometers. So you need to know these two key numbers. Moving on, it says to know that the period of a satellite in a high altitude orbit is greater than the period of a satellite in a lower altitude orbit. And this idea comes from Kepler's third law, where we're saying that satellites closer to a planet will take a shorter time to orbit that planet as they have a shorter distance to travel, whereas satellites further away from the planet will take a longer time to orbit the planet, and that's due to them travelling a greater distance. 
Next, you need to have awareness of the challenges of space travel, and some of them are listed here for you. So the first one is traveling large distances with the possible solution of attaining high velocity by using ion drive, which is producing a small unbalanced force over an extended period of time. Or we have traveling large distances using a catapult from a fast moving asteroid, moon or planet. And we looked at that in the theory video for challenges of space travel, but we called it gravity assist or gravitational slingshot. We also have maneuvering a spacecraft in a zero friction environment, possibly to dock with the ISS. So that's two challenges there, maneuvering in space and docking. And the last challenge mentioned here is maintaining sufficient energy to operate life support systems in a spacecraft, with the possible solution of using solar cells with area that varies with distance from the sun. So that's just getting at the idea of how do we produce electricity? Well, we can do it with solar cells on solar panels. And we're just saying here that the greater the distance of the spacecraft away from the sun, then the bigger the solar panels would have to be to generate electricity using those solar panels. Moving on, it says you need to have awareness of the risks associated with manned space exploration. And some of them are listed here for you. So we've got fuel load on takeoff. Obviously, you want to have enough fuel on board for launch, for getting you around in space when you're there, and for re-entering Earth's atmosphere. But you don't want to take too much fuel because that would increase the mass of your spacecraft on launch. And you don't want to have too little fuel because then you might not be able to move around in space when you get there or come back to Earth. Another risk would be potential exposure to radiation. And we talked about solar flares and exposure to ionizing radiations. Another risk would be pressure differential and temperature. So the extreme differences in temperatures and pressures are what we need to be mindful of when sending humans into space. And lastly, we have re-entry through an atmosphere. So remember, spacecraft need heat shielding materials or heat proof tiles in order to prevent them from burning up on re-entry. Next, you need to know Newton's second and third laws and their application to space travel, rocket launch and landing. So Newton's second law, remember, refers to the idea that if a mass has an unbalanced force acting on it, then it's going to accelerate in the direction of that unbalanced force. Or you can just think about the equation F equals ma. And you also need to be able to use that equation F equals ma in different rocket situations. And then Newton's third law, remember, says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And lastly, for section two, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving weight, mass and gravitational field strength in different locations in the universe. So remember, gravitational field strength G will vary from planet to planet, whereas mass will stay the same. And you need to be able to use this equation W equals mg to calculate either the weight, the mass, or the gravitational field strength. And remember, both Newton's laws and the weight equation were seen in the dynamics topic anyway. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.